in chapter 18, verse 21, Peter uh, pipes up and says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Jesus said to him, I say, not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. But he And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he uh, should pay the debt. So when the fellow servants saw what was done, <clears throat> they were very sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord said unto him, said, <clears throat> after that he had called him, said unto, uh, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest of me. Shouldst not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your heart forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. I want to talk to you tonight, or this morning, about the freedom... Um, in forgiving. The freedom in forgiving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come before you. Thank you again for this morning. Thank you for the uh, worship and song. And, and Lord, thank you for the uh, fellowship we've already enjoyed and for the Sunday school hour, being able to instruct on some serious matters. And, and Father, I just pray that you bless uh, this message. Help me to deliver it as you would have me do it. And I pray that you uh, are, are honored and glorified. And, and Lord, our hearts would be open to you're uh, dealing with us, um, every one of us. And I pray, Father, that you, uh, as I think of that young lady, Chelsea, I pray for her healing, uh, total recovery uh, from the accident. I pray, Father, uh, for Tita Ruthie, as um, she's not feeling well today. Uh, encourage her, Lord, no, no other place she'd rather be, I'm sure, than um, teaching those children. And thank you for Michelle uh, for uh, standing in and, and being the substitute this morning. Bless her and bless those little ones, Lord, that they learn the Word of God just as we learn it here. I pray, Father, that you uh, bless, as I think of next week with the CNE, uh, starting on, fr on Friday, and uh, Lord, uh, going on, I pray that you uh, um, help us to be in prayer during this whole 18-day marathon, and I pray, Father, that you give me the stamina I need for sure, and all the other workers, Lord, uh, help them, encourage them, and I pray you bring souls, Lord, that need to be saved to the booth. I pray, God, that uh, you give us the um, the uh, the right kind of approach toward them and, and, and help us to recall Scripture and even um, the, the right um, uh, discernment, Lord, uh, of the spirit of the people and how to address them. I pray, Father, uh, as well, that you uh, just bless us uh, uh, this day. Give us a good week as we look forward to being in the summer and people are gone and people are vac vacationing. And I pray that you keep us all safe. And as I think of... Uh, Marco, bless him as he's preaching today, I pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, forgive me. i got to take my, off this sport coat. I'm already getting warm up here. I think they turned off the AC. I'm not sure. Um, okay, understand, first of all, this parable is not talking about salvation. It's not talking about salvation. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, it's Jesus. The issue is between man and God. That's what salvation's about. The Bible says that man is alienated from God. We are aliens. Somebody, <laughs> somebody told me that the Bible was corrupted. Our King James Bible is corrupted by some nefarious sources because it talks about 
aliens. You know those green creatures from outer space? And they've been put in our Bible. But that's not what aliens means. Aliens means a foreigner. Somebody who does who's who's uh uh who doesn't belong, let's say. That's an alien. When you're alienated from somebody, that means you're distanced from them. And the Bible says that mankind is alienated from God. And we need to be reconciled with to, uh, back to God. And that's what salvation is. There's a war, basically, between God and man. And God wants, and God wants to bring peace. And that's what Jesus Christ's death on the cross did. It brought peace because he took the judgment upon himself that we deserved. He paid your fine. He paid your debt to a holy, righteous, perfect God. To the court of heaven, if you please. And He paid your fine. Uh, therefore, it's by grace that you're saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, uh, uh, 3 through 7 says it this way. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed up on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. See, Jesus Christ, when he died on that cross, he shed his blood and also uh, God's love was shed abundantly abroad through Jesus to us all. He's the gift to mankind. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's God's gift to us. That's how we know God loves you. So, man, does God really love me? I don't know if God loves me. I don't know what happened in your, what's, what's going on in your life. I don't know what tragedies happened in your life. But I know one thing, God does love you. How do you know that? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for all men. He's the Savior, the Bible says in another passage. He's the Savior of all men. So, and, and he came because God so loved the world. He said, I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'm sending my son, Jesus Christ, to die for you on the cross. So well, how's that love? Because your biggest need is going to heaven. Your biggest need is, is to escape the judgment of hell. And God said, I'm going to solve that. And not only solve that, but he said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit abundantly to give you a new life, a new lease on life. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't get that anywhere else in this world. Religion doesn't give you that. Religion just makes you pious. Religion just makes you prideful. Uh, and maybe it makes you socially acceptable, but religion isn't the answer. It's Jesus Christ. And we have to be sensitive. Listen, if we're going to come to Christ, we have to recognize our need for a Savior and that we were that we are alienated from God, we're distanced from Him. Oh, I always believed in God. So what? If you believed in God. The devil believes in God. That doesn't impress. That doesn't uh, save him. Believing in God never saved anybody. It's believing in the Savior. That's what saves you. And a lot of people believe in God and they think they're going to heaven. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, he said, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, we've done many, even many wonderful works in your name. See, works. And he said, depart from me, you curse and everlasting darkness. I never knew you. Uh, do you know Jesus Christ, your Savior? Or I should say, does he know you? There's a time in your life when that happens. It's like you could know, uh, let's say, uh, when did, when was the, when did, you know, people ask, when did you meet your wife? Uh, 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 when, uh, um, you know, when did you, uh, have meet this other person? Whatever. Uh, all these things are certain times in our life, right? Well, listen, there's a certain time in your life when you meet Jesus Christ. Mine was some over 40 years ago now, way over 40 years ago now. But that's when I met Jesus Christ. I've been religious all my life, but I wasn't saved all my life. As somebody would say to me, I think I've been saved all my life. I said, no. If you either, if you think you're saved all your life, then you are not saved. You get, there's a time, Jesus said this, except a man be born again. That means born spiritually. And we don't come into this world born spiritually. We come into this world a sinner. See, so you say a little baby's a sinner. Yes, the baby's a sinner. 
It just hasn't produced yet. <laughs> I mean, like I have in my, uh, it just hasn't come out and been revealed yet, let's say. Well, I, I don't even know if that's true. <laughs> because a little baby comes out saying, me, 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 feed me, feed me, change me, change me. It's all about me. That's, we see that in na human nature. It's a selfish human nature. They have that, but this is the one thing a baby has over you and me. It doesn't have the understanding. And it's innocence. It still has an innocence of knowing. And Bible says when we know things, that's when we're held accountable. And we can pretend we don't know, but many times we do know in our heart of hearts, and we just don't want to admit it. But the thing is, a baby comes to an age of reason, the Bible says, where you understand, and they think, and we think, once I understand what's right and wrong, oh, now I know, hey, I got it. Oh, you're not supposed to do this, supposed to do this, I got it. And we think we can play the game, and we can't because we have a nature, every one of us, we have a nature that really repels what's righteous. We have a nature that repels what's good. We have a nature that repels God. And that gets revealed. And when we think we got it made, we, re we should come to the realization, I am actually lost. Now you're held accountable to get born again. See, a baby is already saved. They're saved already. But when they come to that age of reason, and whatever that age is, some people say it's 12. It could be four. It might be a teenager. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But you come to an age when you're held accountable before God, and then you must be born again spiritually. And that's... Um, and our text this morning is not talking about that. It's talking about the relationship between brothers. Look in uh, verse 15. It says, Moreover, if thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. It's talking about trespasses. In other words, you're sinning against or somebody sinned against you and your brother. You have a relationship. Not talking about with God. And in verse 21 as well, he says, Then Peter came to him and said, How, how off, Lord, how off shall my brother sin against me? So this, so again, uh, so we're not talking about God and man. We're talking about here, man and man. And not just any old man, your brother. What? Your brother in the Lord. Your sister in the Lord. And just as we said earlier, the humility, the greatness in humility, uh, to, to deal with uh, this uh, forgiveness, this freedom in forgiveness, it really starts with having humility. That's why the chapter starts out with that. And honesty will result in forgiveness in relationships that need to be strengthened or even um, mended. But Peter here, it's interesting, Peter's the one that always, as much as he might be we might look at Peter and say, oh, what are you saying it like that for? Boy, you're, you're really stepping in it, Peter. You're really opening your mouth. You just keep your mouth shut. No. As a matter of fact, Peter is like you and me, only he's being vocal about it. We would think it in our heart, but Peter's the one that says it. And sometimes it looks like it's foolish, but you know what? God doesn't say it's foolish. What he, said, what he uses it is he, he teaches us. Uh, you know, you know how they always say, "I uh, the, the, a bad question is the one you never ask." Yeah. We need to we need to be at least definitely to God be the kind of people that ask God questions. Do you ever read the Book of Psalms? Do you ever read the Book of Psalms? I mean, I'm reading it now, and it's amazing what I'm seeing in the Book of Psalms. I mean, I don't know, I don't know how many times I've read the Book of Psalms, but man, you see David or Asaph or any of them who who who've been compiled in that, in that book of Psalms, and they're always saying, God, why about this? God, where are you? God, what are you? It's always a question about God, just like you and me. And it usually comes down to the point where they, where, where they realize, God, you know everything. You're in control. I understand what you've done in the past, and I can trust you for the future. But I'm saying, Peter here asks the question, and he says, how many times do I forgive my brother? 
uh, seven times? He's, he can't imagine it being limitless. I mean, think about it. How many times will you allow someone to step on your toe? How many times will you allow someone to insult you? Basically, like we would say, you just slap me in the face. I'm not going to let her get away with that. I'm not going to let him get away with that. Peter's thinking, Peter is thinking. Okay. And he's probably thinking, yeah, I'm supposed to forgive my brother. I'm supposed to, I, yeah, I got a brother. Yeah, I'm supposed to forgive Andrew for, or I'm supposed to forgive James or, uh, seven times. That sounds right, doesn't it? And Jesus says, seven times 70. Oh, did he say seven times seven? Yeah, that's right. Isn't that right? Yeah, 140, 100, uh, 490, right? 490. Yeah, I got it right. Okay. So you have to count 100, 101, 102, 103, 200, 201, 203, 300. You're getting close now. Getting close. 400. Well, 450. Is that what the Lord wants us to do? No. It's really crazy if somebody was going to count. You know, it's like they got on their wall. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, five here. One, two, three. I'm counting. I'm counting. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy, right? Well, Jesus is saying, no, it's like anytime, forever. You're always supposed to forgive. And this really was difficult for Peter. But, you know, honestly, the, the rabbis... The rabbis would say three times, that's religion. That's religion for you. Three times, and then after the third time, that's it. I remember talking to uh, some Jewish young men at the CNE again. Uh, I love the CNE because I, it just, it's, it's almost like a safe, safe place for me. I can be a little outgoing there and, and assertive to people. I got my little safe space with the 10, 10 feet around there, but I can walk out there and see people. Hey, how you doing? Hey, come on over here. Talk to them and be a little crazy, right? But I, I like that. And I saw these guys that were Jewish, uh, obviously, because they were dressed sort of funny and they had the little curly locks things here, you know, on the sideburns. And, and, and I said, excuse me, gentlemen, excuse me, I want to ask you a question. And, and I said, can you answer this question? If a person is a murderer, can they go to still go to heaven? They go, nope, nope. I go, wait, wait, what if they what if they're really sorry? What if they they go, nope, they go right to hell. I said, but what I go, there's gotta be some way they can maybe be resolved of that sin, right? And they go, nope, goes right to hell. I was like, what? These are these are young Jews. And I thought, that's not even in the Old Testament like that. You know what I mean? I, I, I didn't really get the chance. They just kept on walking, you know. I wouldn't even stop any farther. But I could have talked about Moses. He was a murderer. I talked about David, what David did. You know, I mean, it's, it's crazy. But that's religion. But Jesus says 70 times 7. There's, it, it's ridiculous to even count. And us as Christians... We need to recognize that, listen, you're living in this world, you're going to be offended by each other. You're going to offend me, I'm going to offend you. I'll give you, I'll tell you right up front, I'm going to offend you. And you know what? You can offend me. Now, if I can't get over it, or if you can't get over it, and it's really pressing on you, then it's incumbent upon the person who feels violated to approach that person and try to resolve it. And listen, once it's resolved, it's resolved. And again, maybe you don't forget, but the thing is you say, I'm not going to bring it up anymore. Well, it's done. But there's no limit. There's no limit. See, because you know why? Because that's what love does. Love does not put limits on how, doesn't count how many times it forgives. It just forgives. Husbands, you don't count. Oh, there she goes again. She's doing it again. I told her, don't do it. And she keeps on doing it. You know, this is the last time. Oh, yeah, what are you going to do? You get a divorce over that? 
because she didn't do what you told her to do, or she did do what you did told her not to do. That'd be a stupid thing, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't make sense to forgive her, right? Yeah, I guess I gotta forgive her. But she better not do it again! You know what? She's gonna do it again. Now what are you gonna do? Or he's gonna do it again. You gotta forgive him. See, that relationship, husband and wife, it's built on love. And you feel like a fool, right? You feel like you're being, I gotta be a wet dish towel or I gotta be a doormat and you can walk all over me. No, that's not what it, that's not what the Bible says. He says, address it. And the example is God Himself forgiving us. So we need to grow, we need to grow as Christians to be dealing with forgiveness. In our, in our, uh, uh, parable, you can call it, um, we see this character who went through three different stages. He started out as a debtor. He owed, the Bible says, he owed 10,000 talents. I had to look that up. Uh, a talent is like 750 ounces of silver. A talent is a, not like talent show, it's a talent is a measure of, of money, like dollar or cents, or something like that. And so a talent was a, um, a measurement, but it, here's the thing. A talent was equal to about 20 years of a, of a manual laborer's wage. 20 years. After 20 years, he earned a talent. That's how much a talent was. They say, uh, according to what I just read, it said about, it's about $20,000 a year. Uh, uh, or in some estimations, they said a talent, if you're going to say 10,000 talents, could be anywhere from $10 million to $4 billion. That's what Jesus is saying here when he says, this guy owed 10,000 talents. It's like, whoa, man, who's this guy, Donald Trump? I mean, this guy's got, uh, but how did he get, how did he owe that money? He pocketed it. He was taking money from his employer. He was taking money from the king, from the Lord, and pocketing it or spending it like crazy. And when the king took him to account, he said, uh, where's the money? You're short. You're short 10,000 talents. And, uh, the guy says, uh, the servant here says, oh, I'll pay. I'll pay up. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pay you back. But then he couldn't pay back. And the king says, you can't pay this back. You're going to jail. You're going to jail, buddy. The guy is ready to go to jail, but he says, but wait a minute. But wait a minute. Have compassion on me and my family. In those days, they took your children and your wife and they, they sold them into servitude to somebody else. Or even maybe even they went to prison with you. All because of his uh, uh, idolatry, lust, uh, covetousness for money. <clears throat> the good news is that the king was compassionate. And the king... Uh, uh, he assumed the loss and he forgave the servant. You say 10, uh, 10,000 talents, the king? Well, you know, so governments do that, don't they? They spend money like crazy. <laughs> Here, we're going to give these people, uh, a, a, we have a new, we have a new initiative. We're going to spend uh, $40 billion on this. Where are you going to get that money from? You. It'll be your taxes. That's where we're going to, and we're going to spend this money here and there. I mean, government does that all the time, right? Well, the king, he's the uh, government this time. And he said, I'm just going to forgive the debt. Just sort of like, uh, I mean, I could think about some other people, but I'm not going to say it. Um, so the guy didn't go to debtor's prison. He was let go. The servant did not uh, deserve forgiveness, but he got forgiveness. It's money. It's in interesting how Jesus talked about money Many, many times when he's trying to talk about spiritual things. You know, in the marketplace, just I'm just thinking this out on a side. 
in the marketplace, there are a lot of principles that hold true, really, and are parallel with the spiritual life of a Christian. And the king had mercy. That's the greatest thing. That was a great king. Good king. Everybody wanted to be under that king. That's for sure. Now, this guy was a debtor. He owed. But listen, he was forgiven. And then he became a creditor. He was forgiven 10,000 talents. And now he's probably taking account, instead of the king's taking account of his money, he's taking account of his own money. What do I got? Oh, I don't have that much. Man, I had a lot of money with, uh, with the king. I can't steal the king's money anymore. So what am I going to do? Oh, yes. I, I lent some money out to that guy. I'm going to go ask that money back again. I need that money. And it was 10, I'm sorry, 100 uh, pence. He owed him 100 pence. I, I didn't know this, but you know, uh, we know what a penny is, right? One, one hundredth of a, of a dollar. A pence is more than a, it's a plural for a penny. That's pences. Just the plural for penny. If you have, if you have five pence, that's really five cents, as we would say. And so, uh, it said that he owed him a hundred pence, and, uh, the, according to what, again, what I read, a person would work for one day and they would make one penny a day. Now, at a uh, hundred uh, pennies, let's say, hundred pence, and you make, a, you make a penny a day, let's say you could use all the... Let's say in a year you could pay that off. You could maybe pay that off in a year. So it wasn't really that much of a of a of a debt that this guy owed compared to what the other guy owed, right? And instead of being uh, examining his life and say, "Man, I had forgiveness for my debt," I guess I should be just as compassionate. He wasn't. He was harsh. He demanded payment. You owe me. And uh, the guy who owed him money, he did the same thing. He said, listen, I, I'll pay you back. But the other guy was stubborn, unwilling. No, no. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna pay for it in, in jail. And he sent the guy to prison, threw him in prison. In those days, you didn't just file bankruptcy. You went to prison. And you got beaten when you went to prison. Uh, praise the Lord, we live in 2022. <laughs> and it's not the greatest, but listen, it's not like these days, those days. So he's legally right, this guy, who, who uh, wants to collect his debt. He's legally right, but he's not morally right. He's not morally right, and listen, everyone else understood that because other people saw what took place and they said, that's not fair. What's that mean, that's not fair? Morally, that's not fair. If he went before a judge and he said, Judge, this guy owes me money. Does he really? Yeah, look at the books. I owe him, I lent him this money. I lent him 100 pence and now, and he, he hasn't paid me back and, and he doesn't know how he's going to pay me back. I don't even care about the money. Put him in jail. You know what the judge would say? You're right. Go to jail. But everywhere else looks and says, it's not right. That guy was forgiven 10,000 talents. And he's grabbing that guy, the Bible says, by the throat and putting him in jail. So, what happens? The king hears about it from the other people. The other servants, fellow servants, and they tell the, they tell, uh, the king, and the king says, oh, is that so? I forgive him 10,000 talents and he's not going to forgive this guy. I'm calling this guy back into the courtroom. Well, into my court. You want to live by justice? You want to live by what you get what you deserve? Okay, you'll get what you deserve. I'll give you what you deserve. You're going to jail. And he sends that guy to jail. 
And the Bible does say there were tormentors. It's not just you're in a cell, you know, eight by eight cell, and you just have to sit there and twiddle your thumbs. No, he's in there, and he has to come out daily for his beating. Like it probably maybe in the Philippines, or I'm guessing, I know in, I know in Singapore, <laughs> you get caned. You know, they have a big bamboo stick. You bend over, and you have so many whacks that they give you. I remember this one kid, stupid American kid, went over to, uh, I think it was Singapore, and <laughs> and he was spray painting signs, public signs or something. They arrested him, and then uh, uh, Bill Clinton. It was back in the '90s. Bill Clinton had to write a letter saying, like, uh, "Be uh, you know, be he's an American citizen now. Be nice to the guy, you know." And they said, "We'll be nice to him." We're, instead of giving him 10 whips, we're going to give him just three. I think they have no. <laughs> so that guy, that young kid, uh, America, he learned his lesson. He'll never do that again. That's the way prison was. And this guy was sent to the tormentors, it says. Now, what is that? Because, listen, this has a spiritual, spiritual, a spiritual significance. The Bible is teaching that we need to forgive. And the way we need to forgive is the way God forgave us. There's no question the, devil, the, the, the king in there represents God in that story. And that servant who was forgiven the debt represents us. And there are other people, other fellow servants, who will, you know, for, who we need to forgive. They can't pay. We need to show them mercy. You know, like the Lord's Prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespass. And forgive us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us. Hey, that's a condition. God, forgive me. You know, I, I, I sin every day. I, I, I don't want to sin, but God, I sin every day. Forgive me. You know, because I forgive other people who, who, who offend me. So God, forgive me just the way I forgive other people. Can you say that? And that's what we're supposed to do. And really, the Bible's saying that when we don't do that, that God takes notice. And many people don't forgive. No, they just hold a grudge. They keep that bitterness. And what happens to them? They've been taken to the tormentors. I don't know what that actually all entails, but when I look at the tormentors and I look at Scripture, a lot of times you see it's angels that are being used. And even sometimes it's called evil messengers that are sent. It's, 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 and really, it's a serious thing. Now, this is not talking about somebody losing their salvation, you know, they were saved. And no, this is talking about what happens in the life of a Christian who's un, who has an unforgiving spirit toward another brother, sister in Christ. They're going to be sent to the tormentors. They're going to, they were a debtor. They were forgiven. They became a creditor, a blessing to other people. But trying to collect the debt didn't work out. And what ends up, they become a prisoner. Now they're a prisoner. People have said this, to err is human, to forgive is divine. Corey Ten Boom, if you know, how many know Corey Ten Boom? She was just a remarkable lady, uh, went through German, uh, not so German uh, concentration camp um, because she helped the Jews and hid them. She was arrested. Her, her sister, her father, um, I think other members, but uh, they, they, others died. She survived the concentration camp. She said, forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. In other words, this, your heart might be saying, oh man, but you have to say, I forgive you. There, I said it. And you know what? Many times when you do the right thing, your heart will follow in the right way. Don't wait for your heart to be right. I'm going to follow my heart. If my heart says I to do it, then I'm going to do it. No. Do what's right and your heart will follow. Yeah, but I don't feel like it. Doesn't matter. It's the right thing to do. 
That's what she's saying. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Martin Luther King Jr. said, forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a constant attitude. That should be the Christian attitude. Someone else has said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. That was Mark Twain. See, the world knows this stuff too. Confucius. He said, to be wronged is nothing unless you continue to remember it. <laughs> you think about that for a while. To be wronged is nothing. But to remember, to continue to remember it, now it's something. If you can, in other words, if somebody can, if you, if somebody can offend you and you can just forget about it, it's no big deal. Then don't, just forget about it. Wonderful. You're free. But if you always have to remember it, you're in bondage now. Nelson Mandela, who spent time in prison, he said, if I walk out the doors toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. With what words of wisdom? Another man said, any fool knows men and women think differently at times. He says, but the biggest difference is this. Men forget, but never forgive. <laughs> women forgive, but never forget. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but still funny. Uh, someone else has said, not forgiving is like eating rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. That's true. We have to be forgiving people. Oh, man, I'm sorry. We know what Jesus said on the cross. He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Stephen, when he's being stoned in Acts chapter 7, people rejected him. They took him outside the city and they stoned him to death. It says, and they cast out him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down at, uh, their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The Apostle Paul, in his ministry, he's at, the, at the close of his ministry in 2 Timothy he said, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Then he says, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. In other words, he's saying, I hope God doesn't hold them accountable for how they mistreated me. Now he wouldn't, didn't say that in anger. He said that in caring about other Christians who actually forsook him. And he said, I pray that God does not hold them accountable for that that rudeness, that act of, 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 of uh, abrogating their position of loyalty to me um, uh, and to the, the cause of Christ. In other words, he had a forgiving spirit. We need to be, or I should say, forgiveness reveals the true condition of the heart how we treat others. When the heart is humble and repentant, we will gladly forgive our brothers or sisters. And when there's pride and a desire for revenge, God will turn us over to the tormentors. Remember Saul and David? I have other illustrations in the Bible. I don't have time to get into it. Saul and David, how Saul, uh, was, he started out okay, but he ended up being a wicked king. And he had this <laughs> torment. The Bible says an evil spirit was sent to him. That's what God promises to the Christian. To the Christian. Yes, he promises to the Christian that has an unforgiving spirit. Receiving forgiveness, uh, or should I say, receiving forgiveness um, should humble us and make us gentle enough to forgive others. Listen, every Christian knows that we had a bigger debt to God that He simply forgave us. 10,000 talents, it's a billion talents that we owe God. 
our offense to the holy God, God is righteous to send us to hell. Uh, and even the lake of fire. But he doesn't because Jesus paid the price. We've received forgiveness. What is it for us to forgive somebody else? It's nothing. And that's why God says, I forgave you. Why can't you forgive him? Why can't you forgive her? Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Lord, we come before you. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Help our church to be people with a gentle spirit, not prideful. Help us to be humble, a humble people. Lord, I, I, we, we're, I, I know uh, we've heard many others. Uh, I've heard uh, people give testimony. We are a sweet church and sweet people, that's for sure. But Lord, I know we all need to grow. Grow in grace, grow in love, grow in forgiveness. And help us, Lord, to grow in this humility and this uh, uh, spirit of forgiveness. And, uh, Lord, that we would be uh, uh, just the uh, uh, testimony uh, to encourage and really show the love that we're supposed to show. Thank you again for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to have a closing song way over. over time. Nelson, if you'd come at this time.